Every day, all around the world, more than one billion bottles and cans of Coca-Cola are consumed. We find it at family gatherings, restaurants, movie theaters, and even in small neighborhood shops, making it one of the most popular drinks after water and coffee. But where does that Coca-Cola that arrives at your table so fresh and fizzy really come from? To find out, we are going to step inside the Coca-Cola facilities in Mexico and take a close look at how the entire process works. So subscribe, leave your like, and join me as we tour the massive factories of this iconic beverage. But before we get to the modern machines and production lines, let's travel back in time to 1886. There, we find John Pemberton, a pharmacist and Civil War veteran, who in the basement of his pharmacy in Atlanta, experimented with tonics that would give birth to the famous drink. There he mixed processed coca leaves, cola nut seeds, caramelized sugar, citric acid, vanilla, cinnamon, lime, nutmeg, and other aromas. Everything was done by hand. He cooked the ingredients in a copper kettle, stirred with a wooden paddle, and controlled the fire by eye, because a single mistake could ruin the flavor. Then he filtered the syrup through a thick cloth, tasted it, corrected the recipe, and carried it in glass jars to the Jacobs Pharmacy, where it was mixed with carbonated water on the spot. Customers paid five cents for a freshly served glass, as if today you ordered a coffee, but instead of an espresso, it was a fizzy tonic. There was no mass production. At most, it was bottled in small jars with corks for other pharmacies. The success was modest, barely nine glasses a day on average. Two years later, Asa Candler saw the potential and bought the formula for $2,300. He was the one who turned the drink into a business. He set up a small plant in Atlanta with tanks of up to 50 gallons to produce syrup in larger quantities. The liquid was boiled in kettles, cooled in open tubs, and bottled manually with funnels and ladles. The bottles were sealed with corks tied with wire and labeled by hand, one by one. Distribution was also simple, by horse-drawn carts or by train. By 1895, Candler had set up a franchise system with bottlers in different states. Even then, the work was still manual, filling bottles on long tables, checking by eye for cracks or impurities, and packing them into handmade wooden crates. Now let's travel to the present. Coca-Cola production has left those artisanal methods behind and today operates as an industrial system with millimetric precision. The company runs hundreds of plants worldwide and produces more than 2 billion servings every day. The goal is simple but challenging, that every bottle or can tastes exactly the same, whether you buy it in Tokyo, Buenos Aires, or New York. But how does a Coca-Cola industrial plant actually work? Imagine the factory as an automated highway. Each bottle is a vehicle moving forward without stopping, and the machines handle almost everything to reduce human error to the minimum. The process begins with the famous secret concentrate, known as Merchandise 7X, the base of the syrup. This is not produced in every plant but in special facilities and is transported in sealed containers, from five-gallon drums to massive tank trucks. Forklifts with sensors carry it to the tanks, preventing spills. The syrup is dark and thick, containing sugar, phosphoric acid, preservatives, caffeine, and a blend of essential oils from plants like lemon, orange, cinnamon, nutmeg, or clove. The curious thing is that the exact proportions are a secret kept in a vault in Atlanta, protected as if it were a bank, armored doors, biometric scanners, and security cameras. Only two people in the world know the complete formula. Once inside the plant, the syrup is transferred to stainless steel tanks that keep it between 10 and 15 degrees. Internal agitators stir it gently to prevent the ingredients from separating, while digital sensors monitor density and purity in real time. Everything is controlled down to the smallest detail. But before we continue, do you know how Coca-Cola expanded worldwide? It all happened during World War II, when Coca-Cola set up portable bottling plants on the battlefronts. These were mini factories mounted on military trucks that produced up to 1 million bottles a month, mixing syrup with locally carbonated water. For soldiers, it was a taste of home in the middle of conflict, but for the company, it meant something more. Expanding the brand globally, because after the war, those soldiers had already carried the drink to new corners of the world. Back at the factory, we reach a crucial step, the water which makes up nearly 90% of what's inside each bottle of Coca-Cola. It is not used as it comes straight from the well or municipal supply. First, it goes through a rigorous purification process to guarantee a clean, uniform taste anywhere in the world. First, 
the water passes through sand and activated carbon filters which remove sediments, chlorine, and odors, like a giant coffee filter trapping the unwanted. Then, it enters a reverse osmosis system, where it is forced through membranes that only allow pure H2O molecules to pass, removing salts, heavy metals, and microorganisms. After that, a nanofiltration adjusts the mineral balance so it is always neutral, and finally, it is sterilized with ultraviolet light and ozone, ensuring not a trace of bacteria remains. Digital sensors monitor everything in real time, pH, turbidity, and conductivity, automatically correcting the process if needed. With the water ready, the mixing with the secret syrup comes next. They are combined in giant stainless steel tanks in exact proportions, approximately one part syrup to five parts water, although it changes slightly depending on the variant. Internal agitators like submarine propellers homogenize everything within minutes. Here, sweeteners are also added. High fructose corn syrup for the classic version, or sweeteners like aspartame and sucralose in the sugar-free versions. Computers control the valves and pumps, measuring sweetness in degrees bricks and acidity with precision. Everything is kept at around 5 degrees Celsius, preventing premature bubbles and ensuring freshness. Before continuing with the step where Coca-Cola gets its unmistakable flavor, remember to subscribe to the channel, leave your like, and comment on what other process you would like us to explain in future videos. Now comes the key moment, carbonation. The mixture enters a pressurized cylinder where pure carbon dioxide is injected at three atmospheres of pressure. The gas dissolves better when cold, forming carbonic acid, which is what gives that characteristic bite when opening a Coca-Cola. The carbonator keeps the mixture moving so the gas distributes evenly, and sensors adjust the pressure to reach the exact point of bubbling. If there is too much gas, the drink foams excessively. If too little, it goes flat. The standard recipe contains three to four volumes of carbon dioxide per volume of liquid, and in variants like Coke Zero, the carbonation is slightly adjusted to compensate for the absence of sugar. With this, the drink is ready and is temporarily stored in stainless steel tanks, waiting for the final step, packaging. Now we enter the packaging area, where speed and precision are at their peak. For plastic bottles, the process starts with something curious. They do not arrive pre-made, but as pre-forms small plastic tubes similar to test tubes. These are heated with infrared ovens until they become flexible, then placed in molds and inflated with high-pressure air, forming the complete bottle in just seconds. The machines produce thousands per hour. In contrast, glass bottles already come ready from external suppliers, stacked on pallets. Before filling, all bottles go through a thorough wash. Even if they arrive clean, the line takes no chances. A rotary machine flips them over, blasts them with filtered and ionized water at 60 degrees Celsius, rinses them with sterilized water, and finally dries them with filtered hot air. Everything happens in a chain, like a miniature car wash, capable of processing hundreds per minute. After that, an optical inspection station scans each container with high-speed cameras and LED lights. Artificial intelligence software detects cracks, deformations, or internal particles, and automatically removes any defective bottle for recycling. Only the perfect ones move forward. The next step is labeling. In many plants, this is done before filling to prevent the label from getting wet or peeling off. A machine unwinds the rolls of labels, applies adhesive at precise points, and presses them on with rollers that smooth them out. A laser system aligns everything so the iconic red and white logo is perfectly centered. These machines can label up to 1,000 bottles per minute. In the case of sleeve-type labels, they are placed like a sleeve and then shrunk with hot steam. And now we reach the heart of the process, filling. The carbonated drink, kept between 5 and 6 degrees Celsius to avoid losing gas, flows through nozzles that align above each bottle. First, the nozzles extract the air from inside to prevent oxidation. Then, they pump the exact amount of liquid using weight or flow sensors, filling each container in fractions of a second without creating excessive foam. A rotary machine can fill up to 60,000 bottles per hour, all under strict control. If the temperature rises too much, the liquid would expand and cause spills, which is why the line is equipped with integrated coolers. Finally comes capping. The bottles move toward a rotating carousel where plastic or metal caps slide down through air-compressed chutes. They are placed on the neck and tightened with hydraulic precision, sealing the carbon dioxide inside. Sensors verify the strength of each seal, because a loose cap would mean gas leaks and loss of fizz. Interestingly, 
In its early days, Coca-Cola was sold only in glasses inside pharmacies. But in 1894, a Mississippi merchant named Joseph Biedenharn had an idea that changed history. He began bottling it in glass so people could take it with them. What seemed like a simple move turned the drink into a mass product, reaching even rural areas. Today, that innovation is the foundation of the entire global packaged beverage industry. Back at the factory, after capping, the bottles pass through a heating tunnel that gradually brings them to room temperature. This prevents them from sweating during packaging and wetting the boxes, which would complicate transport. Then, a final inspection with X-rays or ultrasonic sensors checks each bottle. They look for impurities, incorrect fill levels, or defective caps, and any anomaly is immediately removed. With cans, the process is similar, but adapted to aluminum. They arrive as open cylinders or in flat rolls, are washed with biodegradable detergent and hot water, and dried with pressurized air, like in an industrial dishwasher. During filling, special nozzles inject the drink by weight to guarantee precision without direct contact. After that, an aluminum lid is placed on top and sealed with rollers, creating a double airtight seam. High-speed cameras monitor the process, instantly detecting any misalignment or spillage. At the end, the cans receive an external rinse to remove any residue. From there, we move on to packaging. The bottles are grouped into packs of 6, 12, or 24. Machines cut and fold corrugated cardboard around them, secure it with hot glue, and apply a plastic wrap that shrinks when exposed to heat, like a gift package that fits perfectly. This reduces movement during transport and prevents breakage. With cans, the process is similar. They are placed in trays or sturdy boxes, grouped in layers, and wrapped with shrink film tightened with heat. Robots with arms and suction cups stack the packs on pallets, optimizing every space like a three-dimensional Tetris. And just like that, they are ready for distribution and consumption by billions of people. Let's close this video with a curiosity. Although the formula is an absolute secret, in 2011 a supposed version circulated online based on Pemberton's old notes. It included ingredients like neroli extract and coriander. Coca-Cola officially denied it, but the controversy fueled theories and homemade experiments. And that's how Coca-Cola is made. What did you think of the process? I would love to read your opinion in the comments. If you learned something new, don't forget to leave your like and subscribe so you don't miss the next stories about how the objects we use every day are made and how they work. See you in the next video.